Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third panel of the 2021 Gender Justice Initiative uh, Research Colloquium, which is our annual event where we present all the research being done at Georgetown across, across schools and campuses related to intersectional gender justice. And today is our last and final panel um, entitled Achieving Intersectional Gender Justice Through Policy. And we have five wonderful presentations uh, for you today. And now I'll pass. So my name is Melissa Hafaf. I'm the program director for the Gender Justice Initiative. I am one of the people who worked um, to create um, these uh, three panels for you. Uh, we're very excited to uh, have our last one this morning. By the way, there is a little um, coffee hour after this if you'd like to join us uh, to, to chat. And that way we can all be on the same side of the room as now you can only see us. And now I will pass it on to uh, the moderator for our conversation today, uh, Professor Naomi Mezzi, who is a law school professor at Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you for all of your work putting together just a um, really diverse and robust set of projects. It's exciting to see all of the work going on across the Georgetown campuses and among faculty, graduate students, even staff. So um, I'm really excited to be here for our third panel, Achieving Intersectional Gender Justice Through Policy. I'm going to just very briefly introduce the five panels that we're gonna be uh, having. And then at the beginning of each one, I'll introduce the speakers. Um, I also wanna really encourage both panelists and audience members to um, help create a real conversation by posting questions uh, for panelists and, and trying to engage the different panels with each other. So we're going to talk, I'm going to be fairly strict on time because we have a lot to accomplish in, a, in a, only an hour. And so I'm going to give you a, for the panelists, I'm going to give you a one minute warning and then a, I'll just put my hand up when we've reached 10 minutes. Um, the, the presentations are Data and Civil Justice for All by Tanina Rostein and Anna Stone. The second panel is Beyond Sex Plus, Acknowledging Black Women in Employment Law and Policy by Professor Jamila Bowman-Williams. Uh, third, Responding to Rising Intimate Partner Violence Amid COVID-19, A Rapid Global Review. This is by Jenny Klugman and Sarah Andrews. Sarah will be the one presenting it and creating an anti-racist culture and a historically unwelcoming organization uh, will be presented by Samuel Aronson. And finally, Policy Paradox, the role of Mexico's feminist foreign policy in US-Mexico relations by Elizabeth Pantaleon. I'm really excited to get started and um, let's move straight into data and civil justice for all. Um, T Professor Tanina Rostein is at, uh, one of the, my colleagues at the law faculty at Georgetown and her scholarly and teaching interests focus on access to civil justice and the function of legal technologies that are developed to bridge the justice gap. And her research explores the opportunities and limits of digital tools to provide information about and access to the legal system. Anna Stone is a grad Georgetown Law graduate and an Access to Justice Fellow with the Institute for Technology, Law and Policy at the Law Center, where she works on issues at the intersection of access to justice, data and technology. She's also a consultant to the Legal Services Corporation on an eviction study, focusing on the impact of state and local laws and procedures on eviction rates. Let me turn this over to you. Uh, uh, Professor Rostein and Ms. Stone. Thank you, Professor Mezzi. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on behalf of um, Professor Rostein today. Um, so let me just share my screen. Um, can everyone see the presentation? Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to the Gender Justice Initiative for organizing these fantastic panels and for the opportunity to present. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the work that Professor Rostein and I and our colleagues are doing to launch a much needed civil justice data commons to study gender and racial and ethnic disparities in access to justice and just outcomes in our civil courts. 
Before I get into what the civil justice data commons is, I'm going to touch on what civil justice is, why it matters, and what we know and don't know about it. A quick note on terminology first. This is glossing over some nuances, but for the most part, the difference between the criminal justice system and the civil justice system is that if someone is found guilty in the criminal justice system, they face possible incarceration, whereas in the civil justice system, that's not an option. But that's not to say that the consequences in the civil justice system cannot be serious. Um, like involvement in the criminal justice system, involvement in the civil justice system can have devastating life-altering consequences. Every year, millions of people cycle through the civil justice system in the United States. These are cases that are happening not in federal court, but in local trial courts at the county and municipal levels. And it's in these courts where single mothers are facing eviction from their homes, where families face debt collection lawsuits from the hospitals where they sought care, and where victims of domestic violence uh, seek protection. More than half of civil justice cases um, in our courts have to do with housing or debt, with the majority of these cases involving eviction, foreclosure, medical and consumer debt collection, or small claims, which are typically just smaller dollar versions of these housing and debt cases. About 80% of people being sued in these courts do not have access to a lawyer, and the experience of having a legal problem is a common one. Most people in the U.S. experience at least one civil legal problem each year, um, and people who are poor face more legal problems more often. The evidence we do have suggests the civil justice system exacts an enormous toll on people's basic needs for housing and income stability, their well being, and the well being of their community. People are facing poverty, homelessness, illness, unwanted family separation, or unemployment, and the consequences can be long term. Debt collection cases, for example, can lead to wage and bank account garnishment, an eviction for inability to pay, and even bankruptcy. And eviction, in addition to having lasting negative effects on renters' ability to find affordable, safe shelter, has been shown to have long-term negative health effects on both evicted mothers and their children, including adverse birth outcomes for babies of people evicted during pregnancy, lower school performance and attendance for children in evicted families, and in some areas, decreased rates of lead screening um, for children of evicted households, despite very high levels of lead poisoning among children in both evicted and non-evicted households. So, are, and I just interrupt momentarily, are, the, are you advancing the slides? Because they're not moving on the screen. Oh, thank you very much for pointing that out, Professor Mizzy. Um, that, that, that's showing up. What are you able to see? Now it moved from the, the main title screen to now disproportionate intersectional impacts. Okay. Um, if I go back, did that work? No. Oh. I'm so sorry about this. Um, now it's changed to consequences of involvement. Are we back to disproportionate intersectional impact? Yep. yep. Great. Um, all right. Whoops. Okay. All of this, of course, has been exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, unprecedented numbers of people are at risk of eviction of debt collection, domestic abuse, and other civil justice problems with this risk falling disproportionately on women. Unemployment has been especially high in sectors where women are overrepresented, such as home care and gig work. Um, and the virus has, has amplified existing health disparities by race and gender. Um, communities and family networks have been strained and women have been forced women in essential jobs particularly have been forced to make very difficult choices about childcare um, and whether to leave their jobs. Domestic abuse has also increased, which I believe other presenters will discuss today. Despite the prevalence and urgency of these issues, accessible and usable data to address them and even just to determine their scope are few and far between. 
We don't know how many people are involved in civil cases, what types of cases they face, their family or race and ethnicity characteristics, what led to and resulted from their involvement, um, and whether and when representation by a lawyer or a non-lawyer advocate makes a difference. Earlier, when I mentioned disproportionately high eviction rates for Black and Latinx female renters, um, I focused on evictions in part because they're a crisis at the moment, but also because evictions are one of the only civil case types for which we have that data. We don't know who is most impacted um, and in what ways for other case types like medical and consumer debt collection. The lack of data is a result of a number of barriers to obtaining accessible and usable civil justice data. Civil justice cases are, among, are disaggregated among hundreds, if not thousands, of local courts and county courts um, across the country, each of which may have their own way of doing things like data collection and data sharing. Courts also lack incentives to share their data and make it accessible to researchers. In our research preparing to build the pilot of the civil justice data commons, we encounter judges and court administrators falling along a spectrum from acknowledging systemic racism and wanting to confront it to ambivalence to active opposition to sharing their data for fear that it will make them look bad. Um, once data are obtained, using it is also a challenge because of lack of standardization across courts, even within counties, uh, regarding what data are collected and how they're classified. And in addition, not all legal problems end up in court. Um, in fact, many of them do not. So additional sources of data um, outside of courts may also be needed. To address the need for accessible, usable civil justice data, we are creating a civil justice data commons in collaboration with the Law Center and the Massive Data Institute at the McCourt School. A data commons is a cloud-based platform where users can store, share, access, and interact with data. Data commonses have been used successfully in the health sciences field to accelerate new discoveries about things like social determinants of health. And CJDC is bringing that approach to bear on the civil legal field in the way that has not been done before. To that end, the CJDC will facilitate secure frictionless access to civil justice data for researchers, courts, legal services providers, journalists, policymakers, and the public. Currently in its pilot phase, the CJDC will grow to include court and legal services data from jurisdictions across the country um, and to enable key linkages to other data sets. Matthew Desmond, who founded the Eviction Lab at Princeton, has noted that eviction is to Black women what incarceration is to Black men. Um, and although longstanding, longstanding gender and uh, racial bias in the criminal justice system are well documented, um, and there's little reason to think that the situation is any different across the civil justice system. But except for some evictions data, for some places, we don't have the data. Addressing inequity and distrust in the civil justice system will require being able to measure these things. And the CJDC is a crucial step toward doing this. It will enable us to answer crucial questions about the impact of legal rules on just and unjust outcomes for women, consequences of civil justice involvement for women-led households, and the implications of civil justice involvement for women's participation in the labor market. Thank you. That was the one minute mark. Did you actually, were you able to finish? I, yes, I was. Okay, perfect, wonderful and amazing timing. Thank you so much <laughs> uh, for that. Um, I wanna move us to uh, the second presentation, Beyond Sex Plus, Acknowledging Black Women in Employment Law and Policy. Uh, professor Jamila Bowman Williams is a associate professor of law at, at the law school, faculty director of the Women's Rights Institute, and um, she her research focuses on contemporary bias, on the effectiveness of anti discrimination law, and the capacity of law to pro promote compliance and social change. 
She's a really uh, methodologically innovative scholar who uses social psychological theory and empirical analysis to examine the impact of anti-discrimination law on the individuals it was intended to protect. Professor Williams. Hello everyone and thank you for having me. Can you see the slides that I've shared? Yes, okay, good. Okay, so I am going to share this project um, with you today, Beyond Sex Plus Acknowledging Black Women in Employment Law and Policy. Um, it is an extension of a prior project I wrote on maximizing Me Too intersectionality and the movement with looks at um, workplace harassment. This one looks more at discrimination and harassment in the workplace and the limitations of our current legal and policy structure on dealing with these types of claims and how that harms Black women and other women of color. Uh, so let's just start out um, with that. Let's just start out getting into intersectionality theory as framed by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, this theory is used to, to describe how women of color face unique forms of harassment and unique experiences that are shaped by both race and sex that are both marginalized under the law. Um, these inequalities and these identities are interconnected. Um, so gender inequality, of course, is going to be impacted by racism and classism and homophobia and other issues. Um, and we know that systemic racism is deeply ingrained in our society, just like uh, sexism is. A lot of it has been brought to the forefront with recent movements. So there's a movement for racial justice, as well as the Me Too movement. So there's a broader awareness of these things, but it hasn't quite translated over into our law and legal frameworks and analytical frameworks that are being used in the courts. Um, nor has it really translated over into the policies and all of the reforms that are being um, proposed in this space either. So 30 years after Kimberly Crenshaw laid this out for us and this very important and critical issue, there are still many shortcomings and, and limitations of the law. And that's what I'm going to walk you through some today. Um, and it's primarily just is the failure to recognize these very overlapping um, web of, of um, inequalities that are faced that are not distinctly sex or race, which is what our law asks for. Okay, so most of what I'm gonna talk about today is going to focus on the workplace. That's where most of my work is, even though I look um, across context today, I'm gonna talk, talk about workplace experiences. Okay, so what does this look like for Black women and other women of color? We know that there's a underreporting um, when it comes to this, um, but across the board with all of the metrics, um, women of color always are reporting um, or experiencing higher levels. Um, even when you look at the same jobs and longitudinal studies, there's more, um, more of these experiences of abuses in the workplace with women of color compared to white women. There's been a decline for white women, but for black women, it stayed the same um, over time. So really, if you look across empirical studies, you see the same pattern. So we know this is a widespread issue for all women, but particular issues for women of color who are facing multiple vulnerabilities and forms of subordination. So that's a part of it. Also, the types of, um, of harassment and subordination are different. So there are um, racialized forms of sex harassment that occur. There are stereotypes about their sexuality, um, about being um, for Black women, and, um, for example, the Jezebel stereotype of being highly sexual and seductive and promiscuous. Um, so you see examples of them being told about how their uniform fits in the right places and their, how juicy their lips are or being called um, sluts and black bees um, and, or, you know, things like, um, you know, the supervisor constantly says that they want a piece of chocolate um, from if there's a black woman or someone of African descent. For Latina and Asian women, um, Asian women in particular, there are a lot of um, stereotypes and expectations about being submissive and obedient, other fetishistic stereotypes that and expectations that come up. 
um, Latina women, things about them being exotic or sassy, but still all expectations of subordination that really um, relate to historical forms of oppression. Um, class plays a big role as well. So these are even more heightened for low wage workers. And part of the issue that this is part, um, particular problem for black women and other women of color is because of the overrepresentation in low wage jobs and, and industry. So there's this notion that they should be lucky to even have a job or where else are you gonna make this type of money? And often these women are the sole breadwinners. Um, they also may be undocumented. So they, um, the employer is in control or has a very high level of control over not only their livelihood, but their immigration status, et cetera. So those things come up as well. And the women feel that they have to endure that in order to put food on the table. Um, so that takes us to some of the core issues with anti-discrimination law. Um, so Title VII of the Civil Rights Act is the primary law that deals with this. And it's really built around bringing discrete claims. Um, so, and, and the plaintiffs are expected to say what was the basis on which they were discriminated against or harassed. Is it because of sex or is it because of race? Um, and there's some theories um, where they're you know, able to bring multiple, but for the most part, that is how the uh, law has been interpreted to, to explain which one does the harassment occur based on. Um, this is a problem because for Black women, they really feel, they really feel this um, racialized gender identity, this mixed identity that's not really just so like this, the sex is the most salient or the race is the most salient. So um, for sex harassment, for example, the normative plaintiff will be the white woman who can bring just the sex alone claim and say, this was all about my sex. It wasn't about my race or these other things. So it's really, um, that's the sort of normative basis for that type of claim. For race harassment, the normative plaintiff is a black man who can say, this, these things happen to me, um, whether it's discrimination or some other type of um, um, improper treatment because of my race that doesn't have anything to do with sex. So you can see how then if you're um, experiencing it on both, you can't really be compared to either of those or it doesn't really fit. So you're uh, marginalized if it's happening on both of those because it doesn't fit into that paradigm that has evolved under Title VII. Um, the EEOC says you can bring these claims and bring claims based on multiple bases, but it doesn't pro provide any guidance on how these should be analyzed, how the plaintiffs should formulate them. So there's a lot of confusion for employees, for employers, for attorneys, both in um, the plaintiff side and the defense side, um, and judges in terms of how to look at these, how to think about it when there are experiences based on these um, intersectional identities. So we know you can bring them, but it's unclear what the best approach is. So that's part of why it's really an uphill battle um, for these plaintiffs. So um, when, they're, when people do check multiple boxes, they're half as likely to prevail than those bringing single trait claims. Um, black women and women of um, black women and other women of color, particularly black women, is what I've done the most research on in this. They're even less like less um, likely to prevail on these than people bringing other types of intersectional claims that check multiple boxes. Even less likely to prevail than white men who check multiple boxes. So there's something specific that's not um, of how we aren't acknowledging or really um, providing space for these um, women of color and their, the types of experiences they have. Okay, so let's get into what the courts are doing with this. So again, I mentioned it's all over the place. I started getting into the cases, the case law across the different jurisdictions. So this shows the different ways. So some make you look at them both separately and will not combine them and not look at them together. Um, some have what we call sex plus, which really isn't designed to um, deal with a race plus sex or multiple categories that are protected under Title VII. It's really intended 
to do a sex claim and then another neutral trait or another like secondary trait. So it's not, I'm discriminated against not only because I'm a woman, but because I'm a woman with a child. So other women may not be discriminated against, but mothers specifically are, but fathers aren't like that type of thing. But it's really not meant um, for the type of um, intersections that are built into um, the protected categories under Title VII. And it always puts sex at the center. So that's the problem with that because many times sex is not at the center and these plaintiffs do not feel that sex is at the center, but it forces you into that um, analysis, that form of analysis or that approach of you of bring a sex plus. The courts also are not acknowledging race plus. So you really have to do sex plus, which is not, doesn't fit the reality in many cases. Um, couple of cases in certain jurisdictions are starting to recognize a black woman as a look at it more in the aggregate or totality, which I think is the most appropriate by saying that you can basically combine or, or lay out evidence for the multiple types of either intersectional or the race and the sex together and bring them together in a claim um, rather than separating them out. When you separate them out, then you have to give the evidence for the race claim the evidence for the sex claim. And then under the requirements of the court, they say, oh, neither of those are severe enough when once you parse them out in that way. So then they're dismissed because they aren't bad enough when you pick when you pick them apart. So anyway, those are just some of the examples of um, what we're seeing across the courts. But the main issue here is that it's a big mess, essentially, and there needs to be more guidance on what to do with these. Um, Bastad v. Clayton. So this was the Supreme oh, Court. Jamila, just yeah. interjecting to say you're at time. So if, if you want to just take a, a half a minute to wrap up, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Bastad v. Clayton, this case dealt with um, sexual orientation and transgender status and looking at how um, you can't look at a, a sex, you can't look at sexual orientation without looking at sex and they're intricately combined Courts have been looking to this to also give guidance. Um, some of the courts were supposed to also give guidance for women of color. Um, and then the reform. So this is just getting to some of the policy reforms, both at the state level um, um, and the federal level. The state reforms aren't dealing with intersectionality. So they make all the reforms dealing with sex. But then if you have a race, a racial component of it, it's not reforming that piece. So you still have to arbitrate a race claim or discrimination claim, but you don't have to arbitrate a sex, the sex part of it, for example. You can see how that doesn't work for these experiences that are intersectional, intersectional in nature. So those, that's just an example of some of the limits of the reform, although we're seeing some progress under Biden in acknowledging um, some of these in, in federal and other, other ways, executive orders and other ways uh, in there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Williams. Um, both that and and the first uh, panel were just sort of wonderful encapsulations of so many of the issues that remain for uh, intersectional problems. Let me move on to the third presentation, which is responding to rising intimate partner violence amid COVID-19, a rapid global review. Um, this Sarah Andrews is presenting on behalf of herself and Professor Klugman. Um, Jenny Klugman is the managing director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And her research and work focuses on global gender inequality and development. Sarah Andrews is a senior international pro bono counsel and assistant director of New Perimeter, DLA Piper's nonprofit affiliate that provides long-term pro bono legal assistance in underserved regions around the world to support access to justice, social and economic development, and sound legal institutions. Sarah has led and contributed to projects focused on women's rights, legal education, law reform, access to justice, and economic development throughout Africa, the Balkans, and Latin America. Ms. Andrews. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and thank you very much to Anna and Jamila for really interesting presentations. Um, and thank you for letting me <laughs> crash this Georgetown event. 
Um, as, as Naomi mentioned, um, I'm a full-time pro bono lawyer at DLA Piper and the assistant director of New Perimeter, um, which is our global pro bono initiative. And um, in addition to uh, undertaking long-term pro bono projects that involve travel, we also do research projects um, through which our lawyers participate um, in collaboration with NGOs. And we partnered with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security on this research paper. Um, and I know Jenny Klugman sends her regrets um, and was sorry she wasn't able to join us. Um, so around, um, I, it was around last summer, um, there were emerging reports of increasing instances of domestic violence and intimate partner violence in the wake of COVID. Um, and so we assembled a global team of lawyers to undertake a global review to look at the scope of the problem, but more importantly, how governments, civil society actors and others were responding. Um, and we uh, co-partnered with the Georgetown Institute to publish a report which highlights the response and includes recommendations. We looked at evidence available through January 2021, and we found um, not only disturbing information about the scope of the problem, but some really interesting innovations in how governments and civil society was responding. Um, you can see there, there's a link to the report if you're interested in checking it out. Um, I'll just sort of give you some general context and background. So UN Women called um, COVID a perfect storm for intimate partner violence. The conditions that were present during lockdowns, during the pandemic, um, brought out all of the risk factors that exacerbate intimate partner violence. So with stay at home orders and estimated 2.7 billion women around the world um, were impacted. And for many women, that meant that they were isolated at home with their abusers. Data is still emerging on um, just how much intimate partner violence increased during the pandemic. Um, but it's, it's apparent that there has been an increase and it has impacted all regions. Um, this is some information from the Center for Global Development, um, which, which undertook a survey of different studies um, and found an overall increase. Um, rates uh, of rising IPV were apparent in um, initially increased calls to, to uh, hotlines and helplines. So as you can see in the first week of UK, 25% rise in calls to the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, um, increase of 150% in visits to their website. Tunisia calls to a hotline for IPV survivors increased fivefold. Argentina, 67% increase in calls. Um, and so we see numbers like this um, in regions all over the world. As I mentioned before, the, the risk factors that, that um, exacerbate and, to, and encourage intimate partner violence um, are all things that were present during the pandemic. So economic issues, loss of income and employment, food insecurity, substance use and abuse, which was on the rise during the pandemic, stress and anxiety, feeling out of control. Obviously we can see all of these factors were at play during the pandemic. So um, this is what the UN Women was referring to um, with regard to the perfect storm for intimate partner violence. We categorized um, the types of responses um, that we reported on in the paper into five categories, raising awareness and improving reporting, access to accommodation and support services, health sector responses, economic support and livelihoods, and the role of justice actors. And then the cross-cutting theme across all was the importance of civil, civil society and especially women's organizations on the grassroots uh, level addressing COVID concerns. I'm just gonna run through um, some of the interesting and innovative examples we found. So we saw a lot of creative use of social media to increase awareness and inform survivors about how to access resources. Um, lots of interesting hashtags. And we saw um, 
you know, use of video and multimedia across platforms to try to engage and reach a broad audience. So for example, in Kosovo, there was a UN women campaign called Report Violence Save Lives, which featured videos with influencers, civil society leaders, and government figures, which reached over a million social media users in the first two weeks. Um, organizations used mobile phones and blast texts to reach a broad audience as well in places like Iran, Libya, and Sierra Leone. Um, and we also saw creative use of print materials and traditional methods of outreach, which were very important to reach um, across the digital divide to reach women who were not able to uh, access technology. So for example, in Brazil, community groups hung banners and posters, and they broadcast audio messages from cars um, about IPV in favelas and the slums, which was also important an important way to reach those not only who didn't have access to technology, but women who might not be able to read. For reporting hotlines, um, as I mentioned, huge uptick in, in hotline outreach. Um, but there was also an important uh, reliance on the use of mobile applications, many of which were developed before the pandemic, but were put to very good use during the pandemic. And they're an important innovation. They're an important way for women to be able to report confidentially. A lot of these applications don't record any information on the women's phones, which is really important um, when abusers might um, be monitoring their every move. So an example of a mobile application, for example, in Pakistan, police in partnership with UNFPA introduced an app that allows women to report violence and their location directly uh, to police from their phone, triggering a, the mobilization of a response team. Um, and it also allows women to mark a particular location safe or unsafe, which helps authorities map GBV hotspots. There was um, reliance on uh, encouraging women to use covert signals for assistance uh, in places like pharmacies that were some of the only places that were available and open during the pandemic. So a popular campaign that was started in the Canary Islands and spread across Europe was called Mascarilla 19, which encouraged women to go to pharmacies and request a mask 19 um, to indicate in a secret manner to the pharmacist that they needed, that they needed help. Shelter is one of the most basic and immediate needs of survivors uh, and COVID restrictions limited shelter capacity at the same time as the need for shelter increased. We saw some really interesting um, public private partnerships to try to open up shelter for women. So a number of governments partnered with the hospitality industry to, to purchase unused hotel space. The city of Chicago partnered with Airbnb to make rooms available for survivors. Um, in France, uh, there was a partnership with Uber to make uh, to provide tree, free transportation for women away from a dangerous situation. We also saw the opening of support services in non-traditional locations like pharmacies and grocery stores that were open and easily accessible. With regard to health sector responses, a lot of governments declared GBV health services is essential, which was necessary to provide continuity of care. We also saw an increase in the provision of and the attention to psychosocial support services for survivors. As I noted before, um, the evidence that the economic stressors accompanying the pandemic, including job losses, restrictions on movement, and economic activities, these were all risk factors for increased IPV. Um, and a number of governments provided direct cash transfers to try to assist women. They were not, most of them were not directly targeted at IPV survivors, but some of them were. For example, in Kenya, um, a consortium of NGOs facilitated cash transfers to over 3,000 SGBV survivors and those at risk. Um, with regard to the justice sector response, um, we know that in the best of times, IPV survivors face challenges to reporting abuse. And of course, this was made even more complicated by the closure of, 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 of courthouses. And we saw some um, innovative um, ways to keep justice mechanisms open for women, particularly the use of remote court services. Just 
Um, throughout it all, we wanted to underline and underscore the importance of women's organizations and the response to this issue. Um, and we also wanted to note the challenges that women's organizations are facing, including uh, critical funding gaps and also exclusion from the, the, the process of planning for re uh, COVID response efforts. Finally, I'll just get to um, our recommendations and okay, I know we're out of time, um, but I'll just, I'll just note here that um, we made some recommendations for each of the areas that I've outlined and concluded with the fact that um, monitoring and evaluation efforts need to be continued um, to evaluate the efficacy of interventions and responses and to mobilize both immediate action and to prepare for future crises. And I'll conclude there, thank you. Thank you so much, um, it's both interesting and so important. Um, let me introduce our uh, fourth presenter, uh, Samuel Aronson. The uh, presentation is Creating an Anti-Racist Culture in a Historically Unwelcoming Organization. Uh, Samuel Aronson is an assistant dean for the undergraduate program in the Georgetown's uh, Walsh School of Foreign Service. His scholarship focuses on the Holocaust and the role of science and technology in the Holocaust. He's published numerous articles on anti-Semitism and the use and misuse of Holocaust memory and frequently speaks on the topic. Mr. Aronson. Thank you so much. And uh, please allow me to begin just with some gratitude. I'd like to thank you, Professor Maisie, and to the conference organizers for putting this together. But most of all, I really want to thank my co-presenters. I am so deeply humbled to be on the same panel as you and really inspired by your work. So thank you for what you're doing. And thanks for letting me be an interloper here to your work that is so meaningful. Uh, the, this, scholar, this particular paper um, is really outside. It's a little me getting over my skis in some ways because it's a bit outside of work I've done in the past. But um, in the spirit of higher education, where we always say all research is me search, this is definitely falls into the category of a lot of me search. Uh, when I was a young person growing up, I was very involved in scouting. And after they ended their ban excluding LGBTQ people, I had a chance to return as an adult volunteer. And so I have uh, actively watched from the outside for a long time the evolution of the Boy Scouts of America and their relationship and, and lack thereof when it came to how they've been welcoming as an organization. And since then, uh, the organization has made some changes, a couple steps forward, some a couple steps back, and that's what we'll be looking at this morning. So just some, a quick background. The Boy Scouts of America, as we know, is an outgrowth of uh, scouting worldwide. It was an organization founded over a century ago in 1908. Uh, it was founded by Baden-Powell in the United Kingdom. Uh, Lord Baden-Powell uh, argued that he wanted scouting actually to be a peace movement, which is something that you might find surprising, knowing that they wore a lot of uh, you know, army surplus uniforms in the past. But that was his belief, that by bringing young people together and giving them the skills of leadership, that it would, um, it would promote that. Scouting in the United States began in 1910 and really took off. Uh, it was something that's been very popular across the board. Uh, and Boy Scouts of America can host alums who are very prominent, including heads of state, including presidents of the United States, uh, members of Congress, captains of industry. Most of the first people to walk on the moon were astronauts. You ever think to yourself, boy, what, what does you know, Martin Luther King, Donald Rumsfeld, Stephen Breyer, Colin Powell, Steven Spielberg, Hank Aaron, Gerald Ford, Bill Gates, Sam Walton, what do they have in common? They were all scouts when they were young people and most of them grew up or became Eagle Scouts. The organization itself had a membership zenith in 1972 with about 6.5 million young people in the organization. Uh, in 72, uh, they were about 31% of the 19 million eligible youth, that's young men who are between 10 and 19, they had about 31% of them uh, were actually involved in scouting. Uh, that number has declined and by 1988, that number shrank to 25% and it's declined ever since. Uh, while it was meant to be a peace movement and it was an organization that in theory was devoted to educating and welcoming other people, we know that in fact was not the case. Uh, there was both formal and informal discrimination uh, and a lot of exclusion, in particular that targeted Black Scouts, LGBTQ Scouts, women, and people who are atheists as well. Uh, the first exclusion in scouting began both as policies and practices that made it difficult in most places and dare I say impossible and many others for people of color to become scouts. Uh, the organization began in the United States in 1910 and just a year later in 1911 already we have the first African American only troop that was formed in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Within five years, the national organization began to promote what they called Negro Scout Troops and the first one began in, in Louisville, Kentucky. 
the national organization either allowed local councils, which is how scouting is, is mostly services young people, allowed local councils either for them to permit segregation, mandate segregation, or there was even one local council which barred African-American young men from becoming scouts. Some of the councils that permitted segregation also barred segregated troops from even wearing the scout uniform. So young people of color could be scouts, but they could only be in a segregated troop. They couldn't wear the scout uniform. The national organization created something that they called an interracial committee. And it was the obligation of the interracial committee to, they said, um, you know, promote scouting in underserved communities to bring in more people of color, but it just promoted and created mechanisms for segregated scouting. And we know uh, by 1954, there was only one scout troop that was integrated in the Deep South. Eventually, these policies of what we call now Jim Crow troops began to change in 1974 when the first uh, Scout Council in the South began to preclude that and began to actually integrate their units. At the same time that scouting was shifting uh, to being more intentional about, about welcoming people of color, it was moving the opposite direction when it came to supporting queer scouts and LGBTQ young people. Uh, perhaps this is in some ways how scouting is best known in the public, or at least before the, the series of lawsuits that happened last year, which is brought about its current bankruptcy. The Boy Scouts America had no formal published public policy when it came to queer scouts until 1991, a year after a young man named James Dale, who grew up just a hour or so south of me in New Jersey, uh, who was an Eagle Scout, uh, became an assistant scoutmaster after he became an adult, wanted to stay involved in scouting, went on to college. He became president of the LGBTQ Center, uh, the LGBTQ Youth Organization at Rutgers University in New Jersey when he was an undergraduate student. He gave an interview in a local paper. Uh, that information got back to his scout council and he was received a letter telling him that he was no longer welcome in the organization because he was LGBTQ. Uh, Mr. Dale filed a lawsuit that made its way to the New Jersey Supreme Court. The New Jersey Supreme Court found for him that scouting could not exclude him. The Boy Scouts of America argued that all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the summer in June of 2000, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision found in their favor, uh, arguing that uh, private organizations do have a right to set their own membership standards. That was a policy that the scouts, um, the scouts grounded in two elements of scouting. The scout oath, which every scout promises uh, to behave, including being physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. And the attorneys for the Boy Scouts intentionally misrepresented morally straight, implying that meant you had to be heterosexual. And the 12 points of the scout law, which obligate a scout to be trustworthy, loyal, helpful, and among other things, it, the last two are to be clean and reverent. And they argued that the 11th point of the scout law, that a scout is clean, is inherently incompatible with being LGBTQ, an incredibly hateful message, I think, in particular for young people to hear. And the year 2012, a national committee of the Boy Scouts unanimously voted to continue that policy, though a year later they would change that. And now we see that scouting has, has evolved quite, quite rapidly in some ways in, in just the last a little under a decade. Uh, their membership policies have shifted to be much more inclusive. They've espoused an explicit policies promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. But they, what we've heard some of the other panelists talk about, uh, the challenges of COVID-19 and these lawsuits I alluded to, have really shifted things for scouting. So the membership policies have changed for the better. Uh, beginning in 1974 with the ending of segregated troops, in 1988, adult women could start to become scout masters. Before that, they could lead programs for young people. In 2013, we saw the, the inclusion now of lesbian, gay, and bisexual scouts, uh, young men. In 2015, they allowed for LGBTQ adults to become scout volunteers again. And in 2017, the prohibition against trans youth ended. And now in 2019, young women can enter all scouting programs. So the, the policies of exclusion have for the most part formally ended. But while the policies have ended, as we know is often the case, I think kind of Professor Bum Williams alluded to this, you can have policies, but they do nothing without culture shifts. Now, one element that scouting can take real pride in throughout its history has been how positive it has been when it came to supporting scouts from various ability levels. Scouting has been very intentional about promoting and including young people of various ability levels. They have uh, made modifications to their program, both what we call merit badges, little skills that scouts learn and advancement requirements, ways you demonstrate aptitude in scouting, providing accommodations, extending time, and being really explicit about creating programs to help young people, people who had low vision, no vision, people of different mobility levels, that's been really positive. The National Honor Society of Scouting, uh, called the Order of the Arrow, has also mercifully shifted. Uh, in the past, you'd often see young men 
uh, engaged in cultural appropriation, wearing, as you can see, war bonnets, face paint, body paint, wigs. Its logo had this um, uh, image, it's an image of a Native American that they called the, the MGM, Native American, yeah, MGM Indian, uh, based on those spaghetti westerns you saw at the time. Uh, that has shifted as well, and, and no longer are those a part of the, the scouting, pro permitted in the scouting program at large. As we heard though, membership uh, has declined quite substantially in some ways part of COVID-19, in some ways a function of the bowling alone phenomenon many of us know about, uh, where scouting again went from six and a half million members in the 70s to just last month, they released data showing that just a little over a million members. That being said, the organization is trying really hard now to at least it's espousing a commitment to promoting diversity, equity, inclusion. After the murder of George Floyd last summer and the protests that ensued, Scouting released a statement promising many things, including doing of listening sessions and a survey to better understand the needs of their community, creating a new diversity, equity, and inclusion merit badge that required for all Scouts, incorporating diversity requirements into all their work, reviewing their program to put an end to any racist policies or practices, mandatory training for professionals, and reviewing property names so that we no longer have Camp Old Indian and changing a, or, or the Jack, a Stonewall Jackson Council, both of which existed. Uh, just to wrap things up, what I'll say is while scouting is, is slowly evolving, it's not surprising when we look at some of these questions that, for example, the Pew surveys have tell us about where our program is versus our program designers versus where the youth are. We know that the people who are often making decisions in the organization are, are, are in the, the boomer generation, the silent generation, the parents are millennials and Gen X, and the young people who are Gen Z are far heads and shoulders above them. And so that's where I end this paper by talking to an expert. I really want to go to a content area expert, someone who actually understood this work inside and out and ask him what to do about this. And so I talked to a guy named Charlie Underdown, who's 11 years old from Seattle. And when Charlie was asked about the changes in membership policy, he responded by saying, and I quote, they literally have these pledges and the oath to be kind and courteous and considerate, keeping people out would be unfair. So the experts are certainly behind this work. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I, I wanna thank all of you for being, um, not just for the richness of your work, but for being conscientious about time as well. I appreciate it. Um, so I would like to introduce our uh, last panelist and uh, she'll be presenting a policy paradox, the role of Mexico's feminist foreign policy in US-Mexico relations. Um, Elizabeth Pantaleon is a master of science candidate at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. Her research interests lie at the intersection of gender and international development and diplomacy and peace building in the Middle East and Latin America. She serves as the president of the Georgetown Graduate Student Organization, Diversity and Inclusion, and she is a State Department Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellow and will enter the US Foreign Service as a public diplomacy officer in 2022. Uh, welcome, Mrs. Pantaleon. All righty, everyone, can y'all see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay, fantastic. All righty, let's go ahead. Yeah, and but we can also see your notes. We see, we see lots of thing, windows. Oh, that's yes. Okay, <laughs> let's change that up. <laughs> okay. I recently got a monitor, y'all, so I'm trying to figure out the whole two monitor deal. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. So, is that better? Yes. Okay. okay, excellent, great. So um, first off, thank you so much. And I am honored to be on this panel today and to um, contribute to this forum of scholarship around um, intersectional gender justice. Um, I would like to put out a disclaimer. I am your friendly neighborhood graduate student. Uh, I by no means am an expert on Mexico, but um, I did want to go ahead and um, the goal of this presentation is to provide some background and insights into some of the questions I'm making sense of through my research for um, my US and Latin American relations graduate seminar. So um, let's go ahead and get started. 
Um, I did want to take some time to explain to you all um, what is a feminist foreign policy, what does Mexico's feminist foreign policy look like, and what are the implications of a feminist foreign policy domestically, bilaterally, um, particularly when considering migration policy, and multilaterally. And what are some of the lessons along the way? Um, many of the events and things that we'll be talking about today are currently unfolding. So um, it's kind of hard to have that kind of hindsight perspective since all of this is rapidly unfolding. So um, we're just going to kind of piece together what are some things we're thinking about, some things I'm thinking about as I'm going through this research. Okay. So um, to begin with, a feminist foreign policy is something that is a relatively new policy framework. Um, uh, the first kind of documentation of it was in 2014 when Sweden became the first country in the world to release a feminist foreign policy. Um, Mexico has become the first country in Latin America to adopt the feminist foreign policy um, and really serves as kind of a leader um, in showing that, you know, it's not just countries of the global north that can take on this type of agenda. Um, according to the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, um, it is a political framework centered around the well-being of marginalized people and invokes processes of self-reflection regarding uh, foreign policy's hierarchical global systems. Um, foreign, feminist foreign policy steps outside the traditional approach of foreign policy, um, thinking with its usual focus on military force, violence, and domination by offering an alternative to intersectional um, an alternative and intersectional rethinking of security from the viewpoint of the most vulnerable. So on the screen, you'll see um, kind of the recipe that um, a, a consultation through um, the International Center for Research on Women has kind of put together for what countries can use to put together their own feminist foreign policy that works for them. Um, this consultation brought together more than 100 organizations and governments um, in more than 40 countries to establish this defined um, scope for what a feminist foreign policy is. So um, the five main ingredients include purpose, definition, reach, and making sure that it's something that goes all throughout and disseminates throughout the government. Um, also intended outcomes and benchmarks to be achieved over time and a plan to operationalize. Um, it's great to have this a feminist foreign policy as a vision, but you also need to make sure that you're walking the walk um, with resources, representation and inclusion, re a reporting schedule and capacity building. So now turning to Mexico's feminist foreign policy in particular, um, it, it, was a, it was announced in January 2020, and it is spearheaded by Marta Delgado, who is the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. And in particular, the goal of this policy is to reduce and eliminate structural differences, um, gender gaps, and inequalities in order to build a more just and prosperous society. The intention of this feminist foreign policy, according to Ms. Delgado, is um, to have both domestic implications, that is for societal and government structures, and international implications, which affect um, Mexico's bilateral and multilateral commitments with other countries. So if you look um, on the screen, I have the five principles that are kind of outlined there. You'll see that um, many of it mentions um, the role of the foreign ministry, um, making sure that there's visible equality and also an intersectional feminist approach to feminist um, foreign policy actions. So now we'll take a um, deeper dive and kind of look to see how a feminist and gender policy agenda um, is kind of playing out and how it interacts with the different levels of society and um, domestically, bilaterally, and multilaterally. So looking at Mexico, um, it has recently produced the um, National Action Plan for Equality Between the Genders, so Pro Igualdad, um, which is a four-year plan uh, that is quite comprehensive and is laying out six objectives for achieving gender equality in areas related to economic autonomy for women, the care economy, disaggregated gender data and analysis, um, access to health and political participation and combating violence against women. Um, while this stri strategic plan is um, really, really I, I, in my opinion, I think it's well done, um, it still doesn't really make the exact link between uh, Mexico's feminist foreign policy. Um, and it also appears to lack certain specific calls to action expressed by many feminist activists um, regarding femicide and justice for victims of femicide. Um, Mexico's feminist foreign policy, it's kind of hard to talk about it without acknowledging the current domestic status of um, the feminist movement in Mexico. Um, this 
policy kind of appears to be in contrast um, with the unprecedented feminist protests witnessed on International Women's Day in 2020, where tens of thousands of women went on strike and took to the streets last March. Um, and even um, as recent as last, last month on the 8th, um, where the same thing happened. If you look to the picture that says um, Mexico femini Feminicidia, um, this is a, a picture taken on March 8th of this year um, that has the, a, a wall in front of the, the National Palace with names of victims of femicide. Um, analysts, analysts have suggested that the feminist movement has become one of um, President um, Andres Manuel López um, Obrador's harshest critics um, and often points to the discrepancies between AMLO's government's progressive feminist foreign policy and the apparent friction um, toward the domestic feminist movement surrounding the topic of femicide. So um, another touch point, um, a particularly bilateral touch point that is kind of most at odds with Mexico's feminist foreign policy is migration policy, when particularly referring to um, the Migration Protections Protocol, MMP, or also known as Remain in Mexico policy. Since January um, 2019, MPP uh, forced over 70,000 non-Mexican asylum seekers to await their U.S. hearing dates on Mexican soil. This often meant waiting in border towns in, under impoverished and unsafe conditions, um, which um, adversely and disproportionately affect women migrants. Another symptom of this um, policy um, and how it is at odds with um, the feminist foreign policy is the militarization of the southern border between Guatemala and Mexico. Um, Mexico has deployed thousands of military and National Guard troops um, and this um, to the southern border and it repeats a cycle that places um, people who migrate at risk of human rights violations. Um, and it's interesting to see that um, Mexico's refugee agency, um, GOMAR, still lacks a presence at the ports of entry along the US-Mexico um, border. So um, this, this country, um, this crackdown is, you know, it fails to contribute to any sustainable regional plan to address forced migration. And it certainly is at odds with the tenets of a feminist foreign policy. However, on the multilateral front, Mexico has done a fantastic job at championing um, gender equality in multilateral forums. One example of this um, is how I recently hosted the Gender Equality Forum in Mexico City, um, you know, uh, March 29th through the 31st. And it brought together over 10,000 um, individuals from all facets of society with um, government officials, civil society, um, private sector leaders to um, launch action coalitions to take on the gender equality agenda and also the women, peace and security agenda. This is set to kind of pass on the torch um, for a follow up forum um, in Paris in, uh, in June, where um, commitments will be made by governments and civil society leaders to kind of um, put money toward these efforts. So now let's take a uh, look at the United States and the status of gender policy on these different levels. So the Biden-Harris administration's historic strides in promoting diversity and gender parity um, in the executive branch. Um, and its commitment to advancing gender equality agenda um, via the creation and the mandate of a gender policy council within the White House is commendable. Um, yet the commitment to gender equality implementation has yet to trickle down throughout um, state and local governments, as well as out via foreign policy apparatuses. Um, according to the 2020 US um, Women, Peace and Security Index reports um, reveal that the status of gender equality among women varies differently depending on what state you're in. Um, and there are regional discrepancies and um, also uh, discrepancies that could be broken down along um, race as well and ethnicity. Now more than ever, we can also see that Okay, one minute mark. Um, now more than ever, we can see the domestic and international linkages. So again, um, the migration policy is another um, aspect of our US foreign policy where um, there, there seems to be a, a disconnect between our um, preached values re regarding gender equality. Um, and it, there's immense room for improvement to kind of use a gender lens to improve our policies. Um, I would like to point out that some of the, um, the leaders that are taking on um, the migration uh, regional situation and the, um, the situation down at the US-Mexico border are women leaders, such as um, Vice President Kamala Harris and as well as um, Ambassador um, Roberta Jacobson. And um, also domestically and on a bilateral front, Congress has taken interest in um, working on these issues. And I'll go ahead and take a fast forward to our takeaways. Um, ultimately, through this research, I 
and gathering some takeaways on what what can be said about this um, feminist foreign policy? Would it be something that would work for the United States? Um, and what does it mean for our relationship with Mexico? So I have three main takeaways. Um, the first is that in a changing world where um, world orders appear to be shifting, power dynamics are in a flux and international issues supersede borders. All members of the international community can learn from one another in tackling the most pressing issues of our time and doing away with outdated power dynamics. So this means turning to more, a more participatory diplomacy and international engagement that views partners on equal footing. Um, the next takeaway is that a, fem a feminist and gender policy agenda requires a whole of government approach and commitments in order to fully realize the vision of tomorrow. And um, the last one re uh, relates to um, if Mexico is to stay true to its feminist foreign policy commitments, it must reconcile what it preaches um, in its foreign policy with concrete actions surrounding its domestic gender agenda. Um, and it should strongly emphasize these feminist foreign policy tenets in its dealings with the US on crafting a humane and just response to migration on the ground um, with the crisis at the US-Mexico border. So um, with that said, I just wanted to leave you all with a quote um, by the executive director of UN Women, um, where she says, um, what we want is ambitious and just, and justice is not radical. It is a baseline and it should become completely normal. And I think that is something that we can carry um, and just be reminded of given all the research that we've um, learned about today. And um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, that quote is a very nice way to end the uh, panel uh, in its entirety. I want to, we are a couple minutes um, over. I want to just give us a few minutes to, to think together about a question. Professor Sandberg has offered some um, concrete questions in the Q&A, and I want to um, welcome the panelists to address them specifically. I wanted to ask a question maybe for everyone, which was um, intersectionality has, we, we, we mostly talk about that in terms of intersectional identities and the importance of that. And so many of your presentations have focused precisely on that. But listening to you all together and thinking about your projects, I wanted to think think about um, how we might move toward intersectional um, dom social domains, right? All, so um, some of you have focused on work, some of you have focused on vulnerabilities of intersectional um, uh, identities in the home, in the public sphere, in foreign policy, in private membership organizations, in access to lawyers. And I'm wondering to what extent we can begin to think outside of our fields more intersectionally among the intersecting ways in which vulnerable populations <laughs> feel um, their lack of access to justice. And I mean that access to justice in the broadest conception of that. Um, and, and I wanna just open that question up to the, any of the panelists who it's a big question and 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 highly aspirational. We all have our individual ex areas of expertise, but it strikes me that it's uh, intersectionality is a has is been such an important theme and is an important way of thinking about populations into the future. And I wonder whether we might broaden its reach. And, and anyone want to jump in on that? Yes, Elizabeth. Sure, I could just add a few thoughts on this. Um, I think, and the reason why um, I, I chose to talk about a feminist foreign policy and why I think it's important is that um, it moves from making gender issues um, and like issues of, of, of women's rights and things like that um, from just being a particular lens, but more so to being a tenant that's woven into practice, um, practice of all different facets of society. Um, and I think that intersectionality speaks to that. And it is something that should, you know, it shouldn't just be, let me consider this from this perspective or this perspective. It's something that should be um, 
on your on your mind constantly like realizing that we live in a very diverse world um with people a variety of experiences that are affected disproportionately um by many of the global challenges that we're facing today so it, it's something that needs to not just be seen as a lens but needs to be seen as like something that's interwoven into our work and i think that um by taking just you know as a practitioner um taking the time to like stop and sit as you're you know about to sign off on on a, a project or initiative or something like that and thinking how is this going to affect um different groups uh, women um men boys children people of different religious backgrounds of different socioeconomic statuses i think that really could help us in achieving justice um, for different groups by just initially just weaving in this aspect of intersectionality into our everyday practice. Let me raise one question from the Q&A for you all, which is um, from Professor Catherine Sandberg. And she's asking, a, a number of you um, talked about uh, technologies. And so, for example, the access to justice was very much based on um, data collection, but also technologies, um, intimate partner violence, the, some of the creativity of the apps that were available there. Uh, she asked whether social media is a double-edged sword and how much of it, the negative impact, um, did hate groups broadcast on social media have in relation to um, each of these different topics. And, and I'm sort of, I'm curious, I also know Professor Williams is thinking about this in the larger context of online social movements. And I wanna sort of as a last opportunity, let you all reflect on the extent to which social media is both um, helping and, and hindering the work that you see going on in each of the fields that you're focused on? So a quick answer to that. Um, so Professor Mezzi and I collaborate on the multiple projects that deal with this, um, um, both with Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement, and other social media movements. Um, and we kind of look at it as the promises and the perils of social media. So. There are a lot of opportunities to advance these interests, but there are downfalls as well. Um, particularly with certain, you would think that it broadens opportunity for all voices and there's low barriers to access to social movements and in advancing some of these grievances or issues or forms of subordination, but you can still have a hierarchy within that where certain people's claims and issues or grievances are prioritized in both law and policy and other responses compared to others. So people still fall through the cracks and end up more marginalized in those spaces. Also the misinformation and the hate. And when we're looking at harassment and those things that happen online, those are very traumatic and problematic, especially when we're spending so much more time online now. So going back to your, for your um, initial question, Professor Meze on all of the intersections, Online is another, you know, it's not an organization as Professor Aronson mentioned, but it's, we spend a lot of time there. So I guess you can say it could potentially exacerbate a lot of the issues that we're talking about here, but there's opportunities to raise awareness and build allyships and things like that as well. So our alliances as well. A uh, wonderful response. Thank you so much. And I want to just take a moment and thank all of you for a really superb panel. Um, each of the presentations was fantastic, interesting, um, and just was the hinted at a really um, deep set of uh, research. I'm, I want to invite everyone to join us now afterwards at a coffee break, a celebratory conclusion to the colloquium. I posted in the chat the link for that conversation hangout uh, space. And um, I also just want to thank, at the end of this, all of the work that our executive director of the Gender Justice Initiative, Melissa Hafaf, has done to put the colloquium together. Um, thank you so much, Melissa. You have um, the, 
not just the labor, but the intellectual work that went into it was um, really, really uh, effective. So um, I look forward to seeing everyone at this uh, coffee hour. If you can make it, it's, it's gonna be brief and, and, and informal and I hope you can. Thanks to everyone from yesterday as well for um, joining the conversation. And we look forward to seeing you next year with uh, new, newer and, and still more cutting edge projects. Thank you, everyone. Melissa, do you want, have anything you want to add? No, thank you so much. You, you did such a great job. Thank you all for, for, for your great presentations. And uh, I hope to see you soon in the other space and next year. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.